So, it's getting to be around Christmas time once again, and most of us have a few weeks off of work or school. For most people, Christmas time is all about relaxing, giving or receiving gifts, and most importantly, enjoying some time with your friends and family. But I also think that it's important to think about those less fortunate than most of us, that for whatever reason, be it corruption, conflict, or disease, may no longer have that privilege. In today's video, I'm going to take you back almost exactly 100 years to Christmas Eve 1914, just five months after the outbreak of World War I. If you have never heard about the Christmas truce, or armistice, or in German they call it Weihnachtsfrieden, which loosely translates to Christmas peace, it was an unofficial ceasefire that spread along the trenches in the Western Front, where German and British soldiers met in no man's land to exchange gifts and chat. I'll have some links in the description below if you want to learn more, but I think that the following letter, written in the trenches by Private Frederick W. Heath, describes it a lot better. The night closed in early. The ghostly shadows that haunt the trenches came up to keep us company as we stood to arms. Under the pale moon, one could just see the grave-like rise of the ground which marked the German trenches 200 yards away. Fires in the English lines had died down, and only the squelch of the sodden boots in the slushy mud, the whispered orders of the officers and NCOs, and the moan of the wind broke the silence of the night. The soldiers' Christmas Eve had come at last, and it was hardly the place or the time to feel grateful for it. Memory in her shrine kept us in a trance of sudden silence. Back somewhere in England, the fires were burning in cosy rooms. In fancy, I heard laughter and the thousand melodies of reunion of Christmas Eve. With overcoat thick with wet mud, hands cracked and sore with frost, I leaned against the side of the trench and, looking through my loophole, fixed weary eyes on the German trenches. Thoughts surged madly in my mind, but they had no sequence, no cohesion. Mostly, they were of home, as I had known it through the years that had brought me to this. I asked myself why I was in the trenches in misery at all, when I might have been in England, warm and prosperous. That involuntary question was quickly answered. For is there not a multitude of houses in England, and has not someone to keep them intact? I thought of a shattered cottage, and felt glad that I was in the trenches. That cottage was once somebody's home. Still looking and dreaming, my eyes caught a flare in the darkness. A light in the enemy trenches was so rare at that hour that I passed a message down the line. I had hardly spoken when light after light sprang up along the German front. Then, quite near our dugouts, so near as to make me start and clutch my rifle, I heard a voice. There was no mistaking that voice with its guttural ring. With ears strained, I listened, and then, all down our line of trenches, there came to our ears a greeting unique in war. English soldier! English soldier! A Merry Christmas! A Merry Christmas! Following that salute boomed the invitation from those harsh voices. Come out, English soldier. Come out here to us. For some little time we were cautious, and we did not answer. The officers, fearing treachery, ordered the men to be silent. But up and down our line one heard the men answering that Christmas greeting from the enemy. How could we resist wishing each other a Merry Christmas, even though we might be at each other's throats immediately afterwards? So we kept up a running conversation with the Germans, all the while our hands ready on our rifles. Blood and peace, enmity and fraternity, war's most amazing paradox. The night wore on to dawn, a night made easier by the songs from the German trenches, the pipings of piccolos from our broad lines, laughter and Christmas carols. Not a shot was fired, except for down on our right where the French artillery were at work. Came the dawn, penciling the sky with grey and pink. Under the early light we saw our foes moving recklessly about the top of their trenches, here, indeed, was courage. No seeking the security of the shelter, but a brazen invitation for us to shoot and kill with deadly certainty. But did we shoot? Not likely. We stood up ourselves and called benisons on the Germans. Then came the invitation to fall out of our trenches and meet halfway. Still cautious, we hung back. Not so the others. They ran forward in little groups, with hands held up above their heads, asking us to do the same. Not for long could such an appeal be resisted. Besides, was not the courage up to now all on one side? Jumping up onto the parapet, a few of us advanced to meet the oncoming Germans. Out went the hands and tightened in the grip of friendship. Christmas had made the bitterest foes friends. Here was no desire to kill, but just to wish a few simple soldiers, and no one is quite so simple as a soldier, that on a Christmas day, at any rate, the force of fire should cease. We gave each other cigarettes and exchanged all manner of things. We wrote our names and addresses on the field service postcards and exchanged them for German ones. 
We cut the buttons off of our coats and took it in exchange for the Imperial Arms of Germany. But the gifts of gifts was Christmas pudding. The sight of it made the Germans' eyes grow wide with hungry wonder, and at the first bite of it, they were our friends forever. Given a sufficient quantity of Christmas pudding, every German in the trenches before ours would have surrendered. And so we stayed together for a while and talked, even though all the time there was a strained feeling of suspicion which rather spoiled this Christmas armistice. We could not help remembering that these were our enemies, even though we had shaken hands. We dare not to advance too near to their trenches, lest we saw too much, nor could the Germans come beyond the barbed wire which lay before ours. After we had chatted, we turned back to our respective trenches for breakfast. All through the day no shot was fired, and all we did was talk to each other and make confessions which, perhaps, were truer at that curious moment than in normal times of war. How far this unofficial truce extended down the lines I do not know. As I finish this short, scrappy description of a strangely human event, we are pouring rapid fire into the German trenches, and they are returning the compliment just as fiercely. Screeching through the air above us are the shattering shells of rival batteries of artillery. So we are back, once more, to the ordeal of fire.